so the first talk uh, is by Professor Chiri uh, from University of Western Australia. <coughs> they will talk about uh, technologies for next generation ground-based uh, gravitational wave astronomy. Thank you. Okay. Um, so far, we heard uh, so many fantastic, fantastic science we can um, do with uh, um, LIGO gravitational waves. So now I'm going to talk about how I'm going to make the detectors better so that we can do even better uh, science. So um, as I say, I'm coming from the University of Western Australia. I'm talking basically on behalf of uh, lots of people in our group. And we are a center of excellence of, uh, from Australian Research Council. So uh, basically, uh, we're just going to uh, uh, briefly go through the current uh, sensitivity limitation and what technology we can you know we are doing um, to some possible technologies to improve the sensitivity beyond advanced LIGO and also um, we'll uh, briefly talk about what the eight kilometer de detector sensitivity will um, will get us so uh, first got this very familiar uh, sensitivity curve and everybody saw it for millions of times and uh, this is the uh, current. Maybe it's not so current because uh, oh, sorry, now it's a little bit better uh, advanced LIGO sensitivity. And we're um, aiming for the desi design sensitivity. And uh, what I'm going to uh, show you is so what actually make that uh, design sensitivity limit. So behind, uh, under NISA, there's uh, quite a lot of curves. But there's main several. Um, sensitivity limitations. Uh, seismic, which is the brown one, this is actually is not, strictly speaking, it's not seismic noise, it's actually after the vibration oscillation, uh, seismic vibration oscillation. And then we have uh, gravity ground, uh, gradient noise, uh, also uh, uh, referred to Newtonian noise, and that's what uh, Ray, uh, Ray Weiss said uh, the other day, and then to come to us we can't do anything about it. Um, well, I'll talk a bit later. And the suspension thermal noise is that. We're still quite below the design sensitivity. And, the, and the then there's a, a thermal coating noise, which is quite dangerous, so sort of close to the design sensitivity. And the actually, and the then this is a purple curve. At high frequency, uh, at low frequency, actually, it's the um, Radiation pressure noise, it's a part of the quantum noise. It's a proportional to the uh, power. And then at middle frequency, as I said, it is a coating thermal noise. And there's a vigorous research trying to reduce um, research on the coating materials, try to reduce thermal, uh, coating thermal noise. And at the high frequency, it mainly is dominated by short noise. It's a, it's a quantum noise. It's a basically photon co uh, counting noise. And it's inversely proportional to the power. Now, some people might say, you know, since gravitational waves it, it detector is use, uh, it's, uh, measuring strain, it's uh, delta L over L, why don't we just make it be longer? And, uh, you know, automatically you get a uh, sort of a relatively, if you increase L 10 times, you got strain sensitivity 10 times better. And also, you can say, all right, the thermal noise, although at the moment is not dominant, but if you have somehow you, your sensitivity getting better, then this thermal noise will first will encounter. And so, okay, we'll get, and also, if I look back a bit more, also, if you look at it here, there's a certain little blips. It's actually it's, it's a test mass thermal noise. And then if you're going down on this, this thing will come up. And then if you have a better, a bigger test mass, you would have better thermal noise. And also, at the high frequency, as I said, is limited by this short noise. It's inversely proportional to the photons. And if you increase the photon number, and you automatically reduce the short noise. And things actually, it is, on paper, it's right, but since it's not that simple, there are some technical challenges. 
So first, if you have very, very long arm lengths, I think David mentioned it. If for, for now, if for this uh, LIGO, advanced LIGO mirror, it's 30 centimeters large, and it's two kilometer radius curvature. It's quite flat. And then if you go, go to 20 kilometer uh, and, uh, arm lengths, and you have roughly, say, 50 centimeter diameter, and the, this uh, distance between it is greatly exaggerated. Distance between the edge and the center, it's about nanometer. So it's almost flat, but it's not flat. And it's really challenging how to, how to you produce such. It's not flat. If it's sometimes people say flat, maybe it's even, probably even slightly easier to produce uh, flat. But then it's not flat. You have to have a, you maintain that curvature, but still, you have to, uh, if there's a little variations, if something changes, it's very challenging. Also, if you have a very, very long arm length, this is, you can't, the Earth's curvature will take into account. And then now you are not, you are, or exactly your two uh, 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 test masses suspending the perpendicular to the Earth's gravity center, but then it's not actually parallel. And then your, your vibration in this direction is actually coupled to your uh, laser direction. And usually, uh, when we do vibration oscillation, the horizontal is relatively easy, just pendulums. And vertical is not so easy. Because at the moment, the vertical to horizontal coupling is about 10%, 100%. And so, so that you have your vertical vibration can be 10, 100 times less. But now, if you have uh, the horizontal to vertical coupling, then you have a very strict, more uh, uh, strict requirement of a vertical. It's quite difficult. And also, if you say, OK, I'll have a very high power, and then there's uh, other instability problem. And it's, uh, the list is not exhaust. So, so we have, you could have a longer and a bigger, but then you need more. You need uh, more ad uh, advanced technology, like uh, you first, you have to have low loss coating, and uh, there's the research I said. And uh, then you have, if you have a very high optical power, you to generate that laser first, and then how can you maintain, you have the, the, the cavity um, have to maintain that high power. And then, and then there's the other problem, if you have a very high power, there's a very high radiation pressure force. You should basically blow your cavity away. You have to maintain that. Apart from high power, you have to, the, your coating have to sustain that high power. And then you could go to cryogenic to reduce the thermal noise, which Kagra is now doing. And there are some more novel uh, techniques, what we call white light cavity and squeezing, just trying to push the sensitivity down and uh, increase the high frequency sensitivity and you know, uh, digging down below the quantum noise. So just first, we just uh, flat. The, uh, flash this curve. Uh, so people see this curve, and uh, this is the um, advanced LIGO. And with a little bit of improvement, that's the looking in the future, what sort of we're hoping for. Uh, with a bit of a squeezing and coating, you suppose the coating is not limiting, and this is uh, not too much, then we can get to this uh, LIGO plus. <clears throat> and then another big step we call the third generation. Still, you have, a, have to have a better squeezing. So apart from that, you have <coughs> bigger test mass, 160 kilogram test mass. But now you see silicon, which has a, a higher, <coughs> higher quality, uh, low loss. And then you have to change the laser frequency because silicon is uh, not transparent for one micron uh, laser. And then cryogenic. Then you can bring down to there. Also, in, in Europe, people <coughs> heard about the ET, the Einstein telescope. 
is 10 kilometers. The design is actually you have used xylophone design. You know, at you can see here is a sort of discontinuity. This is a high frequency. I just have very high power. At the, therm uh, the thermal noise here, I don't care. I'm just a high power. And then <coughs> a low frequency, you <coughs> care about the thermal noise and you care about Newtonian noise, and you do special thing about that. You don't need a very high power. Because if you don't have a very high power, the radiation pressure noise is not very high. And also, finally, this is Cosmic Explorer. It's, it's a 40 kilometers. It's very, very challenging. But that's what we're hoping for. Now, let me step back a bit about so this is a, about just a basic interferometer uh, construct, uh, configuration. You see that, that uh, in, it's Con consists of two arm cavities that's resonantly enhance the power already. And then you have signal recycling mirror and it just coherently send the laser back to this, make the power even higher. And the, what I'm going to talk most important is the signal recycling mirror. It's basically the, the gravitational wave comes and it generates side bands and then that's the signal, and then you put a signal recycling mirror here, create a cavity with the um, resonant cavity with the arm cavity, and then the, what we call the resonantly enhance the signal. So this one <coughs> is quite important in the way that first, the whole system now is a coupled cavity. How they couple, couple through all these lasers, um, I, will, I will call this through optical radiation. So the whole system is a coupled cavity. Now, if we can do something for signal recycling, because it's a resonantly enhanced signal, then you can tune it so that it can actually make it resonant at a certain frequency. So that you can see, for example, this red one. At certain frequency, it sensitivity is really, really good. But however, that's because the resonant usually is narrow band. Then this at the cost of the bandwidth. So here, e, this one is, uh, uh, is no signal recycling curve. And with signal recycling, you can see at certain frequency it's really good, but the certain other frequency is actually bad because of the narrow band. But then if we change the dynamics of the signal recycling, uh, it, the signal, you change the dynamics, and then you, you can create uh, many novel um, technologies. So what we, the amazing thing is somebody comes to this idea. Say, how since the signal recycling is usually you know, a cavity, you have to have a certain wavelengths to make it a you know, coherent, going back and forth, added together to have a resonance. And then it's, it's intrinsically narrow band in that certain frequency. Now how about if we have all the frequency resonant in the cavity? And then I can coherent enhance all the signal, whatever, not all the signal, all the frequency, whatever your gravitational wave signal is. You know, because before, I have some frequency have a very high sensitivity. Some frequency has a very bad sensitivity. And you don't know where, the, when the gravitational wave comes, you don't know which one. If you are game and tune this one, and maybe the gravitational wave comes the other um, bandwidth you didn't detect it. So if you can make it all, every frequency resonant, and then you basically will call it a wide light cavity. You are basically lots of frequency coming. And this is an amazing idea. So how do we do it? You know, some genius said that you, can, you create a negative dispersing cavity. So what is dispersion? Now this is an example of a positive dispersion. You light like come in and through um, different uh, refracted, refracted, refracted index. So this is optical path different, and then you, you, you light separate. So if you can create a negative dispersion cavity, so that when light coming in for, for different frequency, they travel different time, and they all 
resonant in the cavity. Um, so there are some proposed technology. Um, okay, before I say, you actually for frequency band we are interested from say 100 hertz or several kilohertz, you only need a very small negative dispersion. And this is, this is, if you're thinking how small it is, it's just about one centimeter if, it, if it's a positive. It's just a one centimeter glass for four, four, four kilometer uh, arm lens. Now, how do we do that? There are uh, uh, proportions like, how are we going to create the negative dispersion cavity? And then, so to, to generate the, we call the uh, wavelength frequency dependent uh, uh, sort of a light speed changing in the um, cavity. So propo uh, there's a um, proposal say, okay, now generally cavity you have a narrow resonance. And then you put some sort of a negative dispersion material inside the cavity. And now your resonance is broadened. Of course, this is generous, you know, strictly speaking, it's not white light to white light, but it's you know, quite broadened, we call it white light, uh, in certain frequency band. You know, the wider, the better. Now, for, there is a proposal to use some atomic um, uh, media to, to put into the cavity. They actually, they, they, they tested it. But however, for putting this thing in the gravitational ray uh, detector, it's very lossy. You know, the, 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 it is too lost and the, the gain doesn't actually compensate the loss. So, um, the, it is actually being um, demonstrated you can have that. Then, then there's another, Hai uh, uh, Miao has a, a good proposal to use the optomechanical filter cavity. You, you didn't put it, you don't put it a, a atomic gas or something, you put a optical uh, cavity into, extra cavity into the signal recycling. And then from calculation, if this optical filter cavity, or cavity is composed of mirrors and the, the one of the mirrors is a mechanical resonator, if the thermal noise issue of the resonator can be solved, and uh, basically you need a very low loss mechanical resonator, and uh, this one will have uh, amazing performance. So how are we going to do that? So basically, this is the picture of the setup we, we're doing in, the, um, in uh, UWA. So we have a, basically we want to generate this a filter cavity. And then the requirement is that this little mechanical cavity has to be very, very, very low loss. But generally speaking, a little mechanical cavity has a certain thermal noise. You can't, can't do anything about it unless you cool it or, or you know, using some magic, but I don't know what magic yet. But so as, as, it, as it is standing alone, it's thermal noise limited. And we're actually using a uh, little, like a 100 micron size little uh, resonator hanging here, we call it a cat flap. And the good, very um, novel um, proposal is using optical dilution to create a very low loss resonator. So what is the optical dilution? So basically, we put you can see, forget about that this bit, but you can see if there's an extra cavity, you put this resonator into this extra um, cavity. And then you trap, you basically using, because the cavity has optical force. The force has, um, in a cavity, has what we call opt optical spring effect. So we basically put this into a separate into a separate couple of cavity, then the cavity has an optical spring. The optical spring is lossless because this is generated by the cavity or um, well, optical field in that sense is lossless. And then 
the the it actually it change the dynamic of the little resonant. So this little resonant has its own spring, and then you have a huge optical spring, lossless uh, optical spring. But then because your your motion is dominated by the optical spring, dominated by the lossless optical spring, so the effect is you generate a very very low loss resonator, and from that we can realize a very low loss uh, resonator. Of course, there's uh, some other thing you have to do feedback and to keep it, uh, um, to keep it uh, stable, and that's some more, more technical thing. But uh, the, the main idea is uh, using optical dilution to generate a very high Q mechanical resonator. Now what we can expect? So what we expect, this, uh, the, this curve, I want, because there's so many curves, but I want you to pay attention. C is the advanced LIGO curve. And for all these few, these curves, it's just with this white light cavity, but with different optical dilutions. And then that one is you know, your best. It's probably hard to achieve. And uh, then with a certain loss, and you can achieve that. You can see that. This scheme actually improved the high frequency sensitivity quite a lot. And uh, maybe in, uh, with a bit cost of low frequency um, sensitivity. But because we, we, from last few days, we heard all, quite a lot of talk about high frequency. At high frequency, we have neutron uh, binary neutron star merge, and uh, you know from uh, and from the low mass black hole quasi normal modes, and the people want to study it, and because the LIGO doesn't have the the high frequency sensitivity is not good enough, and then we can have lots of signs coming out of if you only can increase the high frequency sensitivity a little bit. There's Lots of things we can do. Now for you to do. I mean. And then there's one curve I didn't mention is this one D curve here. That is called standard quantum limit. Um, so I'm going to talk about a li little bit about that. So what is standard quantum limit? Basically, you know, when I said the looking at this curve the middle one, the gravitational wave detector, loosely speaking, uh, high, high frequency is short noise limited, and low frequency is radiation pressure noise limited. You know, if you have a high power, you reduce the short noise, but it, at the cost of you increase the radiation pressure noise, because the radiation pressure, it's a sort of a amplitude fluctuation. And then there's an envelope, and that envelope is what we call standard quantum limit. However, there is a catch. There is a standard quantum limit is calculated, we call it a free mass standard quantum limit. But in, in a cavity with a com coupled system, and it's not the test mass, it's not free mass anymore. So you can do something actually to, to do what we call beating, beating the standard quantum limit. You can make the sensitivity below this standard quantum limit. So the first one, what we do, we, it's a standard uh, thing called squeezing. So what is squeezing is you know, for a light source, and there's a certain noise, and they have phase noise and amplitude noise. And this fuzzy ball has a certain area. It's due to the um, um, uncertainty principle. And you can do something, you say, OK, I am going to do something to make the amplitude noise smaller. But because of the standard uh, uncertainty principle, you actually make the phase noise worse. Right? So this is amplitude squeezing, and this is phase squeezing. Screen. And also, the other thing is, if you reduce the amplitude the smaller, 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 down to almost zero, this noise is still there. 
So this ball didn't reduce. So actually, at the um, origin here, if the amplitude is very small, there will be still a noise ball. They called uh, vacuum noise. So it's nothing but still noise. And then you can do squeezing about that noise. It's a vacuum squeezing. And then, actually, for the squeezing, for the high frequency, the short noise is basically phase noise. And it has been demonstrated, experimentally demonstrated, you do a phase squeezing, and then you increase the sensitivity. And this has been um, demonstrated quite a long time ago. And then currently, the squeezing optics is being uh, installed in LIGO and for the um, O3 run. And now, when I, you can see that because here you can't see the uh, actually, this should make the radi uh, low frequency worse, but because low frequency is not um, radiation pre pressure noise limited. So radiation pressure noise probably is down here, so you can't see the worsening bit. But suppose this noise, whatever it has been, technical noise has been reduced, and you can see the, rate, uh, the uh, radiation pressure noise. And you say, OK, I improve the high frequency uh, sensitivity at the cost of reduce the low frequency noise. And so what we can do, and the people say, what if I can, at high frequency, I squeeze the phase. At the low frequency, I squeeze the amplitude. So that's what m many people are trying to do, is doing the frequency dependent re-squeezing. So if you're squeezing, this is, suppose this is your um, squeeze the light, um, and you can see that the frequency, as uh, the frequency change, the, the squeeze, the uh, ellipse change, change, change. So from uh, if this is amplitude, and it's from amplitude to phase squeezing. But this is not exactly the quantum squeezing, but this is a, this is a classic type of equi noise equi squeezing. But that's what we want for the quantum squeezing. Now from the curve, you can see if there is no squeezing. This is the blue curve here, sensitivity, LIGO sensitivity. If I do phase squeezing, it's this uh, purple curve actually coming down up here. And then you can see the low frequency is worse. If I do amplitude squeezing, I increase the, <coughs> improve the high frequency, uh, low frequency, but the high frequency is worse. If you do a certain angle squeezing, you improve certain frequency. If you can do frequency dependent squeezing, you improve the whole spectrum. So how we do that? <coughs> there are some proposals. Again, this use <coughs> filter cavity, <coughs> external filter cavity, quite long external filter cavity, and also use uh, um, quantum entanglement. I'm not going to go into detail, but there's a, <coughs> some expected performance. If you have a filter cavity, basically in the recycling, cap <coughs> recycling cavity uh, output, out external, say this 20, 20 or 100 meters, and you put, <coughs> squeeze the vacuum. Sorry. <coughs> into the cavity, and then by uh, go through the filter cavity and go through the uh, interferometer, and then you can improve the sensitivity. You can see this advanced LIGO, and with different squeeze <coughs> noise, you can improve the sensitivity by the whole spectrum. But this one, there's a sort of disadvantage, you have to have an extra cavity. And if you make it an extra cavity, long cavity, say 100 meter cavity, is another structure. Maybe it's not, uh, not so big compared with four kilometers, but it's still another one. And actual cavity is also quite complicated. 
this scheme actually being demonstrated with a two meter filter around a very short range, but still have a frequency dependence being demonstrated. And there's now another uh, proposal use no extra, no extra uh, infrastructure, big cavity. Uh, add a little um, op uh, optomechanical cavity here, tiny ones, but however, you generate a entangled pair light into the um, signal recycling um, part. And that by, by then, you use the entangled pair to go through the interferometer. And then you use the interferometer itself as a filter cavity to, 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 the squid, to, gener to realize the squid light, the quadrature rotation. And uh, theoretically, it can produce, um, say, 12, if it's 12 dB squeezing, if it's lossless. However, because the interferometer has certain loss, and then this curve shows different improvements and different loss. And if we have a white light cavity plus the frequency dependent squeezing, and what we can achieve, we can actually achieve to these two curves. And remember, this green one is Voyager. It's basically cryogenic and uh, you know, big, uh, uh, big test mass. And this one is basically a LIGO configuration. And with squeezing and wildlife cavity, we can improve the sensitivity all whole range. And even compare with Voyager, you increase the sensitivity at high frequency. Voyager. So this is all very, very good and fantastic if we can achieve it when we are working very hard to, towards that goal. Now, I have to go a bit fast. <coughs> Sorry. I'll go back to this curve. And uh, then there's a low frequency. We're told quite a lot of high frequency. For low frequency, if we have the frequency dependent squeezing, we actually can surpass this uh, um, radiation pressure noise. And then we'll hit suspension noise. It's technical noise, probably a little bit easy to solve. And we'll hit this world of gravity gradient noise. As the Ray said, we can't do anything about it. It's because it's a fluctuation of like a surface wave. The um, gravity field changes. You can't shield it. right? And then, so you can could be the surface wave. It could be um, could be some local mass change, and even people suggest the atmosphere uh, change. But if we 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 can't shield it, but for the it still is a movement. We still can measure it. But usually, ground motion surface wave is about one micron at one hertz below one hertz. And of us, for ordinary seismometers, we can do thousands times better than that. So we can, if we can measure it, we can build a picture of the uh, gravitational, not gravitational wave, but a gravity uh, field. And then we can use a feedback uh, control to, to cancel it. And uh, one important uh, uh, aspect of this is, is the tilt. So very sensitive tilt meter we have to build ourselves. And there are quite a lot of research at uh, University of Washington um, and uh, UAA and uh, Australian National University. We're all trying to make a very sensitive tilt and uh, rotation um, meters try to uh, feed back to the system. Now, So going back to this uh, picture, we know that we have, this is our goal to go there. This is all very good. And we are working to some techniques to, towards it. But how about you know, what we, from the past, we have all this 
development from Weber bar to uh, cryogenic bar and uh, to interferometer and uh, uh, initial LIGO and advanced LIGO. And then now we are talking about the third generation de detector. And there's a big jump there. How about we have a middle step with word array with like two big jump, not two big jump, like eight kilometers, what we propose. The, 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 the good thing is we use almost all the existing uh, techniques, the so existing LIGO uh, technology. And uh, the other thing is we don't scale, scale up that much. We scale up twice. You know, eight kilometer, eight, eight, eight kilogram of uh, fuel silica. We still use this fuel silica. And uh, then mirror has to be bigger. And uh, the pendulum has to be longer. This is uh, amazing LIGO. It's only one hertz pendulum. And you have to double that. You make it very long, make it bigger. And uh, technically, it's challenging, but it's not po impossible. I'm not saying this is easy, but this is still quite challenging, but it's much um, easier. And then we can have the, um, as David said, semi-underground um, laboratory. Um, we have, mm, this is our dream. This is our uh, Western Australia. We have, at the moment, we have an 80 meter uh, cavity there, but then we hope that uh, we can somewhere, maybe not exactly there, but somewhere we can build our eight kilometer detectors. And we bring the, all the noise to the quantum level to a truly quantum um, instrument. And from that moderate upgrade, we can get four times sensitivity improvement and thinking of how many sources we can get and how much, uh, how much uh, uh, science we can do. So in the last, since I have five minutes, I'll just go very quickly. Um, there's one point we, I want to say is that people said what we just increase the high power. But the high power, there's a thing, very important thing is instability. You know, from the lesson we learned from LIGO, currently LIGO operation, we always try to keep the interferometer stable. You know, all, ma many things drive it unstable. One important one is the parametric instability. That's the one that uh, being discussed, being uh, proposed, uh, suggested long time ago, 20, uh, 2000. And then we, in UWA, we studied quite a lot. Basically, the physics is that in the cavity, you have the cavity mode, you know, high order mode. And then you have the test mass. There's some example, the cavity have all this different mode. And then for mechanical uh, test mass, you have a different mode. If the cavity and the mechanical modes overlap and also meet some certain frequency, and basically, this is the parametric driving it. And then you make it, uh, the, the, the optical power transferred to mechanical power. And the mirror ringing, ringing, and then your cavity can't go anymore. And this one being um, observed, we, we studied, we observed in our AT high optical power facility, and this, this uh, uh, um, mechanical modes, lambda is just going up. And the LIGO actually, just before the O1 running, they, uh, they also observed it. They, ring, ring, they have to just turn the power down, and they ring it down. It, it basically, you ring up, and the cavity basically can't lock, can't lock and then the, the interferometer the, um, can't be functional. And there are lots of control uh, um, strategies, and this is the only uh, equation I have. Basically, you, you, you're trying to reduce the parametric gain. And then you buy, you change, you heat the mirror, and you change the cavity condition so that this frequency condition doesn't match, which is here. And then the other things is that you put a damper on the mirror, try to reduce the Q, there's a QM. You try to reduce the Q, and putting a little bit of lossy damper on the mirror, which at, at the moment, LIGO is install a little damper on it. But are you thinking about this beautiful fuel silica you know, mirror, and you glue some little yucky stuff on it. And then it can, the model says 
it have minimum effect on the thermal noise, but we don't know uh, in reality. So we have to see. And in, in that case, if you reduce this Q, you reduce this parametric gain. So if this gain is bigger than one, it will ring up. If it's, you can make it down to smaller than one, then it will be suppressed. There are some other effects. So I'm just going to finish quite soon. And then, can we design for the future detector? Can we design it so that we can have parametric free? So this is a picture. It's a pretty picture. I want to put it up. Because this is arm length from 6 kilometers to 10 kilometers. And this is the radius curvature of the mirror. The, we can have a certain uh, range we can uh, choose for radius curvature. And, and then here, the, it's basically the color means the parametric gain. The ye yellow is a very high um, parametric gain. So if I suppose I'm just randomly choose one, I'm just choosing this lens. And I'll cut that, I have a look. And I can see, see, this is the, for that lens, and this is the radius curvature. That's the, uh, um, that's this uh, axis. And then this is the parametric gain. And if it's, a, a, this is a log scale. If it's above one, and then it's unstable, and then below one is stable. And you can see there's not so many very good places. And only this little window that at a certain radius curv uh, curvature that there's no parametric instability. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can choose. Uh, this one is more easy. You can see here there's no parametric instability. This is number of uh, parametric uh, modes. And then we can choose design to make this window as wide as possible. But this is very hard because there are so many modes. So we still need all the control strategies. And if you have near here, at least the parametric gain is not very high. And then we can use other uh, control strategy to, to suppress it. So in conclusion, there's many, many, you know, we are working very hard. And the many, many uh, technologies we try to improve, uh, in, implement to improve the uh, sensibility of advanced LIGO and beyond. And uh, then third generation, will, how wonderful we can see the whole universe. Um, and also, we, for the moderate eight kilometers in Asia, I didn't say the, the geometry part, and uh, we, can, um, we have substantial sensitivity in, in improvement, and there's lots of opportunity for great collaboration. Thank you.